everyone. Welcome. My name is Gloria. I'm going to be moderating our conversation today. First of all, I would like to thank you for joining us to our very first hangout of 2021. From all of us here at Leaders of Africa, I would like to wish you a happy and healthy 2021. So Hangout is a bi-weekly show that takes place every Tuesday at 2 p.m. UTC. It's an informative and interactive show, and we hope that you will continue joining us throughout 2021. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and, our, and also join our Discord community. All the links will be shared in the YouTube and the Zoom chat. To join the conversation today, open the chat window and participant panel. On the participant panel, you can use the hand raised button to speak. We encourage your participation at any point, and we also invite you to leave your camera on as we feature you on today's Hangout. Today's topic is going to touch on technology, renewable energy, and economic development. We all know how climate change and rising temperatures have changed the way energy is being delivered. But at the same time, we live in a very economically divided society. Oftentimes, people who need access to energy resources are often left behind. And to discuss this topic today, I am very excited to introduce to you our guest. His name is Christian Kakoba. Christian is a co-founder of BitHub Africa. It's a leading blockchain and research hub based in Kenya. BitHub Africa facilitates part partnership between NGOs, international organizations, and community groups that are committed to supporting new and inclusive blockchain infrastructure. Kision also runs and supports an, in an innovative research lab in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The lab is called Ujengo Lab, where he works collaboratively, co collaboratively with designers, software engineers, researchers, and entrepreneurs to build local te technical talent in the places where technology is needed most. The main focus of Beta Hub Africa is to train engineers to build solutions with an initial focus on the energy market. And since 2016, BitHub Africa has built the largest blockchain community in Africa, hosting over 30 meetups in seven African countries and training engineers who are currently working on distributing energy solutions. So I invite you all uh, to join me in welcoming Christian as he leads today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria, for this amazing introduction. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this talk today. Um, yeah, so um, I mean, uh, I'm so happy, you know, uh, it's always a, a great pleasure to talk to young leaders. Uh, this is the first time for me interacting with the Young Leaders Africa, Leaders Africa. And I would say, actually, this is my first talk of, uh, of the year. This is my first talk of 2021. So uh, to everyone who is joining us today, I would like to wish you a happy new year and to tell you as well that you are the future of the African continent. And what we discuss today, the technology that we're going to discuss today is here to empower you. So uh, let's see how we can join hands together and learn more as much as we can and see how we can solve problems in our continent. So before I start my presentation, I'd like to, to make a few remarks. Um, the first one, I would like to let you know that uh, I'll be doing some, some, some free giveaways just to, to make sure we are all engaged uh, during this talk today. And I think um, many of you guys have not interacted before with blockchain technology or Bitcoin. And as I was telling Peter and Gloria earlier, I like being more practical when we discuss, you know, such like Bitcoin and blockchain. So by the end of this conversation today, I know everyone on the call understand what this technology is all about. And I feel like the best way for you to understand this is to be more practical and more hands-on so you can see actually, you know, what's happening. Of course, it's on the surface level, it's on the front end. But I think when you understand well the front end, it's easy for you to, to get an idea of what's going on in, in the back end. So uh, I think the first giveaway I'm going to do today is to ask uh, anyone on the call if, I mean, you're still new in the blockchain space, you've never um, 
downloaded a, a blockchain wallet or you don't know how it looks like, just uh, as I as I talk, go to blockchain.info. Uh, you can uh, find uh, the application on your App Store or Play Store. You know, just look for blockchain.info and yeah, you download the application and then you can set up your account. And uh, the first person to, to download the account, they can send me their Bitcoin wallet, their Bitcoin address, so that I can send them um, $5 worth of Bitcoin. You know, this can allow them just to play around with it and to see, you know, how transaction happen in, in, in the blockchain. But some of the elements I'm going to talk about today, like public key, private keys, you know, addresses, you know, you'll understand, you know, what the public key is all about and how do we use it to make a transaction happen, you know, in, in blockchain, in the blockchain network. So that's, I think, really a step one for you to learn today, you know, what blockchain is all about and how we're using all this encryption and cryptography to manage transaction and the record, you know, that's happening in the blockchain network. So that's really the, the, the first remark I had to give. Uh, so throughout the the, the the talk today, I'll be, you know, just giving out, you know, free giveaway to anyone, you know, just if you are very engaged and, you know, your question is really interesting and you're making a good point. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah. Uh, the second one, uh, the second remark, it's more of a disclaimer. Um, we always say, um, w please do not take what we say as a financial advice. I think, uh, the, the one thing is uh, being in this blockchain space, uh, one thing we've learned, uh, everyone come in this space with different interests. You know, uh, the early adopters, you know, some people are very curious about this technology. So we call them some, the, the blockchain enthusiasts. They just want to know what this technology is all about. You know, some people like myself, you know, coming here from an, an engineering point, we want to see how can we use this technology today to, to, to empower other engineers in the world to build solutions that, you know, solve the problem that, you know, the needs that we have in the continent, you know, the financial, you know, energy access, how can you use this technology today to solve some of those problems? You know, some people come in as investors, you know, they want to make money, they want to, to trade uh, the, the Bitcoin. So we come here from different angle. And I think we feel like we're not suitable enough to be uh, a, a, an investment firm or to give investment advice. So we always put that, that disclaimer. So we or advise everyone to do their, always their own research. We feel like education is the best investment you can do uh, in this technology. So uh, that's what we've been doing for the past five years, you know, educating people around the world about this technology, uh, training, uh, you know, uh, young engineers in Africa and see how we can work together to solve the issue of the continent. Yeah, so um, with that said, um, yeah, welcome to the talk. And uh, I'll, I'll be focusing today on, uh, my topic today is about mobilizing technology for the equitable distribution of energy resources. So um, before I dive into this topic, you know, it would be interesting for me to talk about my, my personal journey, you know, my, my career path and, how I really got involved into the blockchain space. You know, um, blockchain is really an interesting topic, you know, and for me, I just feel like, you know, for, for many obvious reasons, some of you are probably interested in this talk today because, you know, of the recent moves that we saw in the price of Bitcoin, you know, because, you know, everyone now, the price is giving a lot of attention to, 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 to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. You know, we are seeing, you know, uh, some, you know, many macroeconomic factors that showing that, you know, cryptocurrency is the future. You know, we, we are seeing large corporation and financial institutions from Wall Street, you know, to big name investor supporting and showing interest to this new asset class. So uh, many people who are coming today, you know, to hear about this technology, you know, they, 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 they feel like, you know, this is the future. So um, it's really interesting for me to tell you about my, my, my personal journey and why I really been involved in this space for now about uh, seven, seven years or eight years since 2013, you know, and I think the more, you know, we, we are diving into this talk today, you will see that 
the, the impact of this technology is so huge because you know of even how we saw that last year you know the succession of unprecedented unprecedented, unprecedented events you know with the pandemic you know we we kind of lost you know there was huge impact in our economical social you know political you know sector and we kind of lost trust with you know all these institutions with our leaders and what we really believe they should they should be doing for us so uh, this my story today it's about to show you why you know i got involved in this space and what really pushed me to believe that this was the future for us so um before uh, you know, discovering blockchain or Bitcoin, actually uh, coming across the, the Bitcoin white paper. I was, you know, an entrepreneur in, based in Nairobi, running my own technology company. And, you know, um, I, I met uh, my co-founder, John Karanja, uh, who is in Nairobi. Uh, we we're working on, on, on amazing, you know, solution. And we happened to, to build an e-commerce platform uh, called CrowdPesa. Uh, I'm sure many of you can probably still spot CrowdPesa somewhere online. Yeah, but it was one of, you know, among the brilliant, you know, e-commerce uh, website that we built in Africa. And our, our goal was basically just to connect the consumer and the, 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 the seller, the buyer and the seller, and be able, you know, to, you know, just provide services like Amazon in Africa. So that was around 2011, 2012. And one of the challenges we had, you know, back home, was you know uh, how do we process you know uh, online payments you know so uh, looking being in the west you know many of you are very familiar with you know card visa debit uh, visa and mastercard you know we are, we are very familiar with paypal so some of these uh, solutions are not really available to 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 many folks back home or even when they're available you know it's so expensive for them they cannot afford it so we successfully built this platform. We are able to roll out many retailers on our platform, but we are having a big challenge with payment because many people could not, you know, buy stuff online using uh, uh, Visa or MasterCard. And the only way for us to actually accept payment online was to integrate services like M-Pesa. You know, at the, at the time, 70% of the Kenyan population uses M-Pesa. So for us, the only way to be successful was to get, you know, uh, this platform integrated on our platform. So we started engaging with the telcos, you know, just to find a way to, you know, to, to be able to integrate this platform on our e-commerce and to be able to start generating like revenue, you know, have some traction, some metrics to, to raise more funding. But you know, one of the challenge we had was the telcos could not provide us with an API, you know, for us to make this, you know, integration happen. It was really hard for us to, to get that end-to-end, -end, you know, integration and be able to process any transaction on our platform. So it was really challenging for us to pitch to invest and tell them how much potential our platform had in 2012. Uh, there have been a lot of development with them. Pesa, now it's easy for you to go and you know, ask for this documentation we asked eight years ago, but it was really challenging for us to, you know, be able to, to bootstrap our, our, our idea and to even be able to, you know, get to a point where we could run a sustainable, um, you know, a business. So um, we, we were doing a lot of research about payments and one of the challenges we had even with m itself was, we, we, were, we were dreaming big, you know, just a way to scale our solution out of Nairobi. How can we bring this to other, you know, countries, you know, neighboring countries like the East Africa, in, you know, in, in, in Uganda, in, in Tanzania, or other places as well. So it was a bit challenging because you find there's a big problem with interoperability. You know, when you have a, a system in, in Nairobi, in Kenya, if you're moving to another country, you have to talk to the telcos again in that country and see how you can make similar integration. So when we are doing our research around payments, you know, that's how we came across Bitcoin. You know, we went for our first conference in, in 2013, the AfriCoin, where people were talking about, you know, this digital currency. So 
we started doing our own research, you know, uh, reading the white paper. So everyone on the call today, I think this is really the starting point, you know, for everyone, you know, go ahead and read the Bitcoin white paper. Or if you go to bitcointalk.org, but it basically, you know, talk about the vision that Satoshi Nakamoto had. And for us, this was, you know, a, an open eye going to that nine page document and understanding the vision of Satoshi. You know, myself having a background in maths and having a background in software engineering, it was, you know, very complex because, you know, the whole aspect of the Bitcoin white paper, you know, touch a bit on, you know, the aspect of statistics, economics. So it was really interesting for us. And we started believing that this is it's the future because it's allow us, you know, as software engineers, we, we, we are what are entrepreneurs, we are what we call innovators. And the centralized system today, I think they're not open to innovation. You know, if you have to, let's say, build on top of a banking system, you need to go meet with them, have the approval process. And it, it, it's really it, it's really hard, especially for entrepreneurs or for startup who don't have enough capital for them to go through that process. It's really hard for us to, to innovate. So again, being an entrepreneur in Africa, we had many challenges. And for me, it was with blockchain technology, it's an open source technology. You know, if you want to integrate this on your platform, you know, you can do it in, in a day, in a week. And the next day you, you start to process, you know, you start to accept payment on your platform. So for us, this was, you know, an opportunity. And we felt like with all the challenges we have in Africa with our currencies, you know, with the way we, we, we deal you know, with each other, you know, in terms of trade, you know, the political, we felt like, you know, blockchain technology, it's the future for us to hold each other accountable in how we, we trade the, with, with each other. So it was really clear to us that decentralization, you know, it, it, it's a future. And I think right now, when even we look at what's happening around the world, you know, we, we are living in the era of global communication, you know, with the internet. And, you know, things are really changing every day, you know, and all this failure we are seeing from the political, social, or economical scene, I think, we believe it's due to some lack of, you know, scalability. You know, there is really uh, the inability for us to process the huge you know, amount of you know, information and the whole complexities that come with it. I think, uh, you know, when we design all these AI, you know, machine learning models, I think there's so many things we didn't take into account that, you know, they're going to happen. You know, a few days ago, I think many of you guys on the call had experienced some glitches with, you know, Gmail, you know, so imagine in the world, you know, not being able to access your email. And this is really, you know, you rely on this to, to, to get your work done, to communicate with everyone and connect, especially at this time during COVID with the quarantine, you know, this was the only way for us to really communicate. So imagine, a, a big service like Google, an institution like Google not be able to keep their server uptime. And even myself being in the blockchain space, you know, we've experienced similar glitches with centralized exchange, you know, and these are things you don't see uh, in this decentralized exchange as we call them DX. And all this because of the way the technology is set up in the blockchain space that allows everyone to be involved it allows us to manage that issue of scalability. So again, as I talk about payments, you know, and me running my startup, uh, it's easy for me today to integrate this payment on my platform and be able to scale it globally. So we believe that, you know, the world is becoming more global than it was before. And we need to find a way to also globalize the institutions, you know, that they're working, uh, who are working uh, with us. So, what is a uh, blockchain? Um, I think many people, you know, uh, before you, we, we end the call today, I would like anyone here to, to have an, a very basic definition of what blockchain is, because, you know, it, it's been really hard for us to really explain this to people, but, um, and we always say it's good to explain to me like a two year old. And, Today, I'm just going to give you like some of the key points that you need to remember. And for me, it's more of the tracking and the storing data. You know, blockchain basically allow everyone to store and 
this information, the way the, the, the chain of blocks keep track of, you know, all the encrypted transaction, you know, from various wallets and how users are interacting. That's really number one, why blockchain is, you know, and it created trust uh, among the users. So blockchain has what we call consensus mechanism, you know, Bitcoin has what we call the proof of work algorithm and the, the other, you know, a consensus mechanism that exists like a proof of stake, delegated proof of stake, there are many of them. And each one of them defines basically the rules of how people who are connected in the network, you know, will be interacting, how much, you know, a miner will be rewarded for processing a transaction, how, you know, transaction will happen, for example, in a block and, and so on. So these are basically rules that make me and yourself trust each other. But as well, uh, with blockchain technologies, there, is, there are no intermediaries. Like today, when you're sending money, you know, in, in your bank, your bank needs to make sure, you know, there is a correspondence between you and the person you're sending the money to. So with blockchain, now you become your own bank where the people who are actually securing the network are what we call the miners, who are basically playing the, the roles of, you know, validating the, the transaction. And lastly, all this record that we have, they're permanent and they're immutable. No one can ever change uh, any transactions on the, on the blockchain. So these are some of the main characteristics of, of, of blockchain technology. And if, you know, you want to build a system and you want to remember uh, some of the key characteristics of blockchain, I think, it's more of, you know, the storing and transmitting information without, uh, without the control of any, uh, the control of anybody, you know, of any, you know, control body. There is no centralized institution that basically uh, manages this. And from a technical perspective, you can consider this as a distributed database, you know, uh, where information is transmitted, you know, by different users and it's verified you know, with this network of miners in, with the interval, in an interval of, of blocks. Yeah, so, I mean, for, for the past years, I think we've been teaching people about, you know, various terminologies, you know, like uh, the wallet, uh, the wallet, many of you downloaded, you know, the, the, the blockchain wallet, and you, it, we use it basically to, to send and, and, and to, to manage transaction between uh, uh, people are involved in, in, in into the uh, in the network. Uh, we also use keys uh, to send each other money. So we have the public key and, and private keys. Uh, these are encrypted uh, cryptographic keys that we use to send each other money. And an address basically has a public and private keys. So an address when you send me BTC, uh, I have to use your your public key to send you BTC and. The private key is basically used to unlock, uh, you know, this signature, and then we have the transaction. So uh, at Bitab Africa, I think what we've been doing the, for the past years is more, of, you know, training people, uh, providing that support and education. And uh, we've been working, for example, in Kenya with, with Strathmore University, you know, to provide, you know, uh, uh, education to. Uh, some of the computer science students, you know, giving them uh, blockchain programming courses. And we've also partnered with other, you know, blockchain institution and engineers to see how we can train other um, students just around the continent in Africa. Uh, last year, we've, we've hosted uh, conferences uh, with Howard University in Washington, D.C. And I think the goal for us was, you know, to see how we can you know, work with some of the university here in the U.S., you know, including uh, uh, HBCUs, Historical Black College and, uh, and, and universities, and see how we can, you know, get some of the, you know, students to, Black students to learn about this technology. And uh, I think we've seen a lot of them, you know, coming back to, to Kenya and work with our, uh, our engineers, and see how we can well build, you know, open source and permissionless innovation. And I think this collaboration has helped us to figure out some of the gap, you know, that we are having uh, back home, and how we can, you know, develop this approach to, 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 to create, uh, you know, collaborations. 
So um, Before, um, I'm going to jump in there quickly for a moment. Before you continue with the conversation, I have a question. Um, you've explained quite well what the technology is and um, ways in which um, you know, engineers and innovators and entrepreneurs can make use of this technology. But let's say I'm just, I'm an ordinary person. I'm not technically inclined. I don't do software development. Um, technology is not my field. How can this innovation, how does this innovation impact the life of this person? And you also touched a bit on, on solar energy and how does this technology make a uh, play in a role into the issues that we have, let's say for with electricity, we know that electric access to electricity is a big problem in so many parts of Africa. So how is this work impacting people who are in that place where they trying to understand um, how solar energy can be can be extended to them? Yeah, so some of the challenges we've had so far, for example, um, coming from the continent, 70% uh, of uh, people back home don't have access to power today because, you know, of, you know, the, the centralized, um, you know, there's that many limitations, you know, it's it, the, the centralized system today, you know, it it's not really accountable. It, it's really expensive for people to, to afford, you know, the way they are mini grids today are designed, you know, it, you need a lot of capital investment and it's not sufficiently flexible, you know, for so many business cases. And so the end user today has not been able to tap into, you know, to have access to, to the power because of some of the instruments that being used today, you know, it's make it not affordable for them. So uh, today, for example, with decentralizing that aspect, it will help us to cut down the cost, for example, of access to electricity and it's going to make it affordable for everyone else to be able to afford, for example, you know, uh, power back home. And this is, you know, one of the projects we are, we are basically working on, uh, Melanin Solar, and we are, we are running a, a pilot in Kenya. And I think for us, the main goal is to address those challenges of, you know, the system of production and distribution of energy. How can you build sustainable microgrid system that can allow, you know, the household today to, to connect in a sort of, you know, a crowd grid modality, and they can use blockchain, for example, to collect and manage the excess of deficits uh, of, of, of the power and be able to transact between themselves in, in a peer-to-peer -peer model. And we feel like there are many advantages, you know, and benefits that this, there are many benefits that this technology can provide, you know, by allowing, for example, this household or these users you know, to, to become uh, uh, prosumers, you know, so they, 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 they can produce and, and consume at the same time. But also it's make it, you know, more affordable, sustainable and transparent. And in a way that, you know, the infrastructure today that's needed to, you know, uh, deploy, you know, or, or install these facilities, it becomes, you know, less encumbersome because everyone who is involved in, in the project now is able to, to, you know, to use, for example, the, I'll give you an example for what we're doing in Kenya. You know, we have um, many households today who have, you know, access to the solar and they are interconnected between themselves into a sort of, you know, a mesh network. And each one of these households, for example, has a smart meter that we've designed, an IoT device that basically can track the average usage of power for a, a household. And whenever you have excess power in your house, you know, if anyone in your network ha need, need access to the power, the system will know where to source for the power and you get rewarded immediately, you know, for, you know, selling power to your neighbor. So it's make that automation, you know, it, that process is very smooth and it cut down, you know, overhead cost, you know, operational costs that many of these solar, you know, companies, you know, had to cover, you know, for them to scale their solutions to, to remote areas. And you see, it's make it even more global in a way where I can be here in the U.S. today 
and buy power for my grandmother in the village because I have an application um, that we've designed that can allow you to go and log in and buy some token and go send this token into her address or in her, her, her smart meter and how to have access to power. So for us, we feel like this is a starting point because for my grandmother to have access to power, for us to develop the industry, for us to develop the agriculture back home, we need first the access to power. Then we can talk about things like the internet and the industrial revolution. I see Ghana has a question. Ghana, you can go ahead. So thanks so much for this uh, uh, highly uh, educating uh, section. You know, I've had a lot of doubts about uh, this blockchain of a thing, particularly the uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, so I'm so much excited about this uh, component of your work that involves uh you know expanding access to electricity through this particular uh mechanism so, so my question is this uh for those that are extremely poor that has always been my interest in everything i do uh uh how can this particular platform empower you know them to uh, increase their access to such important uh, resource like electricity like if somebody is not doesn't have somebody who's educated enough to know how to access crypto all this kind of currency all, all this kind of sophisticated thing we are talking about and, and a good percentage of the population in africa particularly in the rural communities that you mentioned fall into this parameter so what are you guys doing to expand access are you like indigenalizing the process of assessing this currency in a way that even the stack illiterate would be able to assess it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ghana, for, for your question. I think um, one of the key challenge technology has today is, you know, how we, we interacting with the user experience. You know, it's been very difficult, especially me being in the blockchain space, you know, to see many people who have not been conversant with the technology to really understand what blockchain was all about. And I think there's still so much risk today for just an average user to interact with blockchain technology because, you know, there's so many, you know, um, risks, you know, in terms of security, you know, not everyone will know how to manage a public and private key address for you to be able to secure the money that you have, you know. And I think we are moving you know, this technology, we say it, 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 it's, it's only 10 years old. It's gonna be 11 this year. And we're still at very nascent, you know, a phase where we are now seeing ourselves developing, you know, a front-end, you know, user-friendly application, you know, we, that call distributed application that a user now can download on their mobile application, on their, on their mobile phone, and be able to use them, you know, smoothly like a WhatsApp, you know, where you can just, click a button and be able to purchase an a, a, a token. So you see, for example, the, 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 the end user application that we are building here, you know, will allow anyone, for example, in a village, you know, with a smartphone penetration, everyone today is on WhatsApp. I can call my grandmother on WhatsApp today and have a video call because she knows when it's me who is calling and she can pick up the call. So uh, this is an opportunity now for us to allow the end user not to actually know what's happening in the back end and just to know, okay, this is how much token I actually have in my house. If I need more token, I need to click here to top up. And if, you know, this, my balance is less, I, I can add. And if I have more money, you know, this is how I can interconnect. So this is actually where we are heading to. Uh, right now, as I said, we are piloting this project in, in Nairobi, Kenya. And our goal basically is to see how can we collect much feedback from our user and to see how we can build end user application like this one that's going to be very smooth and easy for them to use in the future. So um, hopefully, you know, when this is ready, we'll be happy to share this with the leaders of Africa and the whole community and you guys will also be able to give us, you know, some of the feedback. I mean, that was very helpful to know. And uh, before you proceed, yeah, because uh, I deal with issues of uh, innovation and diversion across spaces. It's one of my areas of expertise. 
And uh, so, so, so I'd like to know, what are some of the other impediments that uh, you are facing introducing the technology to differentiated markets? For example, you know, are there some of these things that has to do with cultural norms? I know you've mentioned the issue of trust, which is a major one, particularly when it comes to disseminating this kind of what I call transformative technology. You know, technology that uh, for the most part breaks apart from the existing trend that people are used to. So, so what are other constraints that you guys are facing aside of trust? Are there components of the challenges related to uh, perception of the attribute of the technology? The and uh, if an attribute of the tech, if attribute of the technologies are affecting the tech, uh, adoption, uh, which particular segment of the society is having issue with what attribute of the technology? Because for someone like me, I like to know because I do some research. I uh, some of these, uh, you know, response from you can direct my interest into a possible research area that we can work on for people like you to benefit from. Yeah, yeah, I mean, being in the in the blockchain space for the past uh, seven, eight years, I think one of the main challenge we've had, I think it's, it's a lack of knowledge. The reason why there's, you know, uh, issue with trust today is because so many people are not knowledgeable about this technology and they don't know what the power this technology provide to them. And that's why for us, I think education has been one of the key components for us, you know, partnering with an institution like Strathmore University, you know, uh, doing a conference like the blockchain summits, you know, globally here in America and around the world has been an opportunity for us to basically educate the masses and see how we can get them involved in some of the projects that we're basically working on. So I think, you know, that's lack of knowledge uh, has been one of the main issue the second thing for me, I would say it's uh, the lack of adoption, which basically comes again with lack of knowledge. You know, there are not many people today who know this technology or who are interacting with, you know, some of the opportunities that this technology provides to us. So I can launch today um, a, a, an amazing platform. You know, I can, you can have all the amazing, you know, opportunities that it provides, but because people don't interact with, you know, this kind of technology or they're not familiar with, you know, what Bitcoin or blockchain is, you know, it's easy, it's it's hard for me to to tap into that market. So when you look today at the 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 the, the blockchain, you know, users around the world, people who actually know what a, or have interacted before with a Bitcoin or blockchain wallet, there are very few people. So when I launch a solution in this space, you know, there's that lack of adoption that we are still dealing with. And I think with time, you know, we feel like there's, you know, a certain time where people probably will be more comfortable when we have those user-friendly application where they know, okay, this really add the value because, you know, and now they can be more involved and now it will make it easy for us to actually, you know, uh, uh, work together. Yeah. There's a, there's, a, there's a long list, you know, but I think those two are the most prominent right now. So thank you. Yeah, let's continue. Yeah, there are opportunities for collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. So thank I have you. a quick question, Christian, before you continue. I'm curious about the the, the 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 trial that you're doing in Kenya right now, especially when it comes to distributing uh, solar energy using this application that you talked about. Because for this service to be delivered on the large scale, you will need the buy-in of the government. So I'm curious, you've done quite extensive work both in Kenya and in the DRC. I'm just curious about what is the government's attitude towards solutions like this? If you had support from the local government, what is the reaction? Because definitely they would need to be on board for these services to reach uh, the, 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 the people. Yeah, thank you for that question, Gloria. I think um, from my years of entrepreneurial entrepreneurship, you know, being involved in the startup uh, community, uh, one of the things we've always advocated, you know, it's um, well, the partnership between the public and private sector. We feel like it's always important because, you know, for 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 the small entrepreneurs to be successful, the government need to help, you know, enable that environment that need to create the infrastructure that needed for them to be able to scale. So 
yeah, I mean, for us, you know, uh, the, the gentleman who just asked the question right now, some of the many challenge we have had, for example, you know, with this technology were issues around policy, issues around regulations. So we could not move without really engaging the government into, you know, this kind of project that we are doing. So uh, the good news is really, you know, before we actually went to, to, to do this pilot in, in Nairobi, we're working with an amazing organization called HIVOS, HIVOS East Africa. So they've been involved into, you know, policy making, and they've been really involved into renewable energy. And they've really uh, introduced us to the county government of Kajiado, who, you know, have been working with us together to deploy this solution in Kajiado to the Maasai people, you know. So if you know a bit of the Maasai, it's a culture that really it's, it's mobile. So this technology was quite interesting for them because they're always moving in different places. So they wanted something that can allow them, you know, in their mobility to, to actually scale. So uh, yeah, there've been a lot of discussion we always have in government because we feel like they are the one who are gonna lobby for this and, you know, push for this technology to actually be implemented at a country level you know, uh, at the continent level as well. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting about them, the Maasai people. Good to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we, we've been working in, in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, but we have the largest community across Africa. And I think one of the things we've been doing, it's more of, you know, education, but I think we are working with different partners as well who are, want to tap into the, the African market. We have people who have services like, you know, remittance in allowing people in the diaspora to send money back home using, you know, the, the, the Bitcoin and blockchain. People who want to launch exchanges. Uh, you know, our goal is basically to see how can we enable this technology to actually benefit the people in Africa. We feel like, you know, the market need is very huge and we need those strategic partnership to, to work together and see how we can collaborate to drive this disruptive technology. I have some video references that I can share with you guys this slide so you can see, you know, a bit of uh, our story, you know, what we do. And you can actually see our initial prototype, you know, for the solar mining and research lab, you know, this is something we tested out, you know, the, this was like our prototype number one. I think there've been a lot of iteration that's happened. We are doing our documentary for, for the project in Kajiado. It's going to be out maybe soon, uh, sometime end of this month or early next month, you know, so you can just see, you know, the kind of setup that we've done and how this household are, you know, interconnecting and, and working together. But this video is one of you know the first tests we did in our office, and we are all excited to just see how we are connecting the dot. You know, there have been so many improvements after this. So um, yeah, I have my contact, my partner Wayne Karan Wainaina Karanja, and myself. If you want to reach out to us, you know, feel free to 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 have a chat. We have a Telegram uh, a Telegram uh, uh, group. Um, anyone, a developer, uh, someone who wants to learn more about this technology, you come and meet uh, many people, you know, entrepreneurs who want to learn more about this technology. So uh, feel free to join our Telegram group and yeah, we'll be happy to, to engage with you. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Christian, for that enlightening uh, presentation. Is anybody in the audience, um, if anyone has a question? Yeah, I can see a lot of hands. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Um, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, so one question that I have is, has to do with the Africa Continental Free Trade, um, which has been implemented just um, this January. So um, this gives opportunity for African countries to trade among themselves because we know that trading among African countries is the lowest compared to other regions. So in the course of trading, in the course of um, different transactions taking place because of this trade agreement, there's going to be movement of money all over the continent. So how does um, the big chain and the Bitcoin um, come in? It, yeah, come in to help with the smooth um, movement of money from different regions um, on the continent and also to prevent money laundering. Yeah, so... 
That's that's a very interesting question. That that's really a good question because I think uh, one of the things, for example, we uh, we've seen in the past, um, uh, we've seen, for example, the the diaspora, uh, the Ethiopian diaspora, the very uh, good. Uh, they've made tremendous progress in investing back home, and I think one of the Talk, for example, I had with you know one of the the representative was, for example, to see how we can, you know, build a token model that allow them, for example, to allocate, for example, a, a certain amount of fund, you know, for their project back home, and they can monitor, you know, how much progress people are making, and the more they redeem the tokens, you know, it shows, you know, progress of what people are doing there, so they can get paid based on you know, such kind of progress. So I think what Bitcoin uses today, it's what we call a, a global currency. And this currency, basically it's, it's managed uh, and controlled by this group of miners today who help hold each one accountable. So for example, uh, what we say um, for the African continent, you create, for example, Africoin currency, and you say, you define the rules of how this, countries in Africa are going to trade between themselves and what will be, for example, the, you know, the, the, some of the areas of, you know, uh, some of the areas of trade that need to be recorded on, on a blockchain and how do we compensate each other, for example. Uh, this applies as well to, I think we, we've seen many uses in terms of, you know, how can two countries, for example, use a token model today to to make it more efficient for them to, 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 to for example, you know, trade. Uh, it's like a collateral, you know. So when I, I buy something from you, I know that this token, for example, that you know represent it's a representation of of work, you know. You 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 can redeem this, you know. So it it, it it's basically um, the, the the token model make it uh, more easy for us to to be able to track you know, what is actually happening on the ground. For example, when you have a representation, for example, of the, uh, I saw, for example, with, with the COP21, where uh, the countries, for example, they agree, for example, to, to monitor the emission of gas, for example, of CO2 in, in the continent, but there was no a, a, a mechanism that could hold them accountable for them to say, this country, for example, this is how much effort they made, for example, to, 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 to monitor this emission of gas. So now when you build a token model where you say, we are going to give you this uh, amount of token for the amount of work you do, it's become easy for you to track what exactly happened from each uh, one region. And for us, I think it's the same thing that really apply with, with, with what you just explained right now, where we have one African uh, a token that allow us to basically uh, define the rules of how each uh, countries in Africa will be uh, interacting with, with everyone uh, uh, in the continent. And I think one of the things that, you know, blockchain has allowed us to do today is to solve the, the issue of, of scams. You know, uh, blockchain is open source. So uh, whoever sent the address, I don't know if, if Gloria, we already have someone who sent the address. So whoever sent me the Bitcoin address today, you find the public key, it's an encrypted key. It's everyone can see on the public key, for example, how much was sent to me. So it's been easy, for example, today for the exchanges to blacklist, for example, a, a, an address that's been involved, for example, in a, in a ransomware or in you know um, online fraud or anything, so people actually thought that Bitcoin or blockchain was you know for scammers you know for for you know for hackers, but it's it's hard for people to actually use Bitcoin today you know to 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 do those 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 fraud because it's easy for me to know that this uh, Bitcoin address is blacklisted and no one can process the funds from this Bitcoin address. And for us, I think it's make it easy for us to, you know, create that transparency and, you know, and in, in what we are, we are trying to build. Yeah. 
uh, Christian, just to mention quickly that yes, we have somebody who downloaded a wallet from blog, Blockchain Info, and that that is Hilson. Okay. So we might you might need to connect with him and and continue and give him the prize that you won. So for now, we have we have another question from Peter. Can you paste his address in the meantime so I can do the transfer? Okay, I will. Let me ask him. Um, Gloria, I have a follow up question. Oh, go ahead, Eva. When Eva is done, then we can move over to, to Peter, who has a question. Sure. Uh, um, thank you, Christian, for the explanation. Um, one thing I want to ask is that how much can you transfer from one Bitcoin account to the other? Because you know that um, in transferring money from banks to banks, especially when you are dealing with continental or different regions, you are limited to um, 10,000 uh, per transaction. So with Bitcoin, what is the limit? of transferring money from, from one country to the other. The good news about Bitcoin again, and uh, it's really allow you to send an, an unlimited amount of fund with a very you know minimum uh, transaction fee. Today I can send you $1 million worth of Bitcoin and pay maybe less than $10 to send you that. So, and that's why for us today, uh, this was a huge opportunity for Africa because when you're using, you know, third parties, you know, remittance service like, you know, Western Union, you know, or the banks, you know, there are so many overhead costs, you know, and it makes it really expensive for us to, to send money back home. And we felt like Bitcoin was one of the scalable solutions for us, you know, to be able to, uh, to, to send money back home. You know, the, the Congolese diaspora ha has been, you know, willing to invest back home but it becomes very hard for them, for example, to, to send money because of many transaction fee and many limitations they have. And now with Bitcoin technology, it, it, it's really easy. I think one of the, 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 the project we've worked on on the early days in, 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 in the space was uh, Bitmari. And Bitmari basically was allowing um, uh, the Zimbabwean in the diaspora to invest in the farmers you know, in, in the village back home. And that was a huge success because, you know, the, the farmers only needed a wallet where the people in the diaspora will just send money and they will destroy it and they will continue with their farming activities. Yeah, so we, felt, we feel like this is, you know, the future for us to actually engage with, you know, with some of the project back home. Okay, um, one last question. Mm -hmm. How do we encourage the uh, the African Continental um, Free Trade um, Secretariat to adopt the Bitcoin and the blockchain in helping with transaction on the continent? Yeah, I think. And uh, and and sorry. And the last question is: Does that do, you, do you recruit any interest when you have your money in Bitcoin? Uh, I didn't get the last question. No, I'm saying that you accrue any interest. Um, when you have your money in Bitcoin? Yeah, so I think, let me ask, I'll start with the first question. Yeah, we've been having a lot of talks, you know, with uh, engaging uh, all the uh, governments, you know, I'm, I'm myself from Congo, you know, there's an unlimited way blockchain technology can help us today, you know, manage all our resources, you know, our mineral, you know, and for us, it's really important to see how can we, you know, tap into, you know that's um, that that space and engage them. So we talks like this with the leaders of Africa. You know, it, it's something that we you know puts our voices out there to see how we can get you know the the AFCTA, the Africa Free Trade Area, to actually look at opportunity like this. Um, now the ambassador, um, uh, the African Union ambassador, um, was one of our key not uh, speaker at our previous uh, Black Blockchain Summit, you know, uh, Sister uh, Arikana has really spoke loudly about blockchain technology, about technology and how it can help empower the, the, con the continent. Unfortunately, she's no longer the, 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 the AU ambassador. So uh, she's really helped us to uh, tap into those doors. And I think we've seen many people as well, you know, coming back home, people like Econ, you know, starting Econ City in, in Senegal, you know, they've been also, you know, trying to see how they can engage some of the policy makers. So we are really, you know, looking into, you know, uh, engaging continuously, you know, the African leaders and see 
how all of us can actually benefit from, from this technology. And I think from the success of some of the project we are currently working on, like the, the melanin solar project I just talked about today, you know, from the success of many of the young leaders yourself understanding this, because we we are actually the future, you know, we are the one who are leading the, the Africa free trade area tomorrow. So it's by understanding this technology today that, you know, we are going to set up, you know, the rules that's going to define how we interact with each other. Well, about the interest, as you can, as you know, uh, the, the Bitcoin value basically, you know, um, fluctuates, you know, there's always volatility. So definitely, I, I'm not sure how much the price of Bitcoin is today. So for people who've been interested in, into trading, you know, uh, yes, they, they buy and they hold for some time and yeah, they, they earn some interest when, when the price goes high. And there are many ways actually to, to earn Bitcoin, you know, is one uh, becoming a, a, a miner, you know, where you set up the whole infrastructure, you know, and be able to like process transaction in the network. These are some of the training we provide at Bitab Africa. You know, when you look at our curriculum, if you go to melanin.academy, you see we have a full cu curriculum, you know, of, uh, of on blockchain. And one of them talks basically about mining. How does mining work? How can you set up your computer in, into mining? So uh, we have so many uh, even uh, use cases of people in Africa who have been able to set this up. And I think for them, it's more of, you know, allocating some resources they have to buy these devices uh, that will provide them some Bitcoin. And then it's getting some value of interest, as you said. You know, and also people actually, the other way is more of, you know, uh, getting uh, freelancers, you know, freelancers who work online and they only want to, to be paid into Bitcoin. And some of you will get paid in Bitcoin and then you keep the Bitcoin and then it's it, it gain some interest. And some other people will just buy the Bitcoin and, 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 and wait. Yeah, so yeah, Bitcoin gains some interest sometimes. Yeah, Peter, I can see Peter has a question. Yeah, thank you, uh, Christian, for your talk. I really appreciate it. Um, a couple of, of, uh, of things. The first thing, you, you, you frame this as sort of beneficial because we don't have to go through normal government regulatory processes. But one could argue that those re normal regulatory government processes are important um, because they ensure some level of stability in the financial system. And as you know, one of the biggest threats to the financial system and people's livelihoods is instability uh, in, the, in the financial markets and with, when it comes to money instruments, for example. And you've also mentioned that Bitcoin has had sort of substantial fluctuation. I believe it's down 20, 30 percent in the past few days. Um, uh, I, I don't know what it is today, but it's it's fluctuated. So um, is it a really uh, is it a good thing that we are perhaps thinking about bypassing regulation that could be important? Now, on the one hand, and I'm curious your response to this, on the one hand, you could say argue that that is good because governments are perhaps incompetent to manage the financial instruments that they already have, and you've alluded to that. And I know that some in our audience come from Zimbabwe, and the experience in Zimbabwe is uh, one of hyperinflation, of changes of the currency that happen overnight, that, that volatility there. Um, but, you know, other countries have done slightly better with their sort of the management of their currencies. So I, I'm curious whether this uh, uh, promotion of blockchain technology and particularly Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies is simply a way for us to say, well, we don't have to worry about having uh, stable and competent governments. We can sort of work around them as opposed to perhaps saying we need to invest in the competence uh, and the, the quality of governance to maintain a viable and uh, an innovative financial sector. So in other words, are we sort of circumventing the issue um, that governments have um, by you know, pursuing cryptocurrencies? Um, or is it something that needs to, or should we be seeing reform and, and innovation on, on both levels? I guess I'm curious your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the, remarks we get when we're in the blockchain space, I think people used to say a bit of, uh, we're kind of anarchist, like people who uh, don't want to deal with government. We want to 
you know, do away with that. There's a lack of rules, you know, in what we do into the blockchain space. But uh, one of when you get involved in the blockchain space and interact a lot with this technology, you get to understand that this technology actually has the rules that are followed, that are permanent, that no one can change. And the miners who control this network are what we call the gatekeepers. And they help us actually hold each one who interacting with this platform more accountable. I think after COVID, we can see that the institutions who actually had hope, they've let us down and we found that the system that was put in place to deal with the health, the social and the economic or political, they've actually don't exist. And for us, we feel like this technology, it's a way for us to strengthen what has already been developed in terms of election. You've been involved in the elections. I think you know exactly what has been happening. For example, you know, everywhere now, not just in Africa, but even here in America, when it comes to these elections and, and the, the vote, and we feel like this technology today can allow us to define the rules and the gatekeepers now today can hold each one who is being involved in, into the space. Yeah, so uh, we are not saying we are eliminating the government, as I said, you know, our goal is really to work hand in hand with the policy maker and to see how we can make this environment, you know, uh, very convenient for everyone who is involved in this space. And I think we're always happy to engage, you know, with you know, regulators and see, you know, how do we work on the policies the best we can and use the technology, you know, to make it more uh, advantage to, to the end user. Great. I um I don't know if anyone else has a question. Who's on the call today? You feel free to write your question in the chat. But um, if not, I have one last question, Christian. That has to do with the research lab, the training that you provide to young people, uh, specifically. How affordable it is? We know. Uh, being myself having trained in technology i know that technology training can be quite pricey mm -hmm. and how are you making access to that training accessible to vulnerable community or people who cannot afford like the regular prices of some of these trainings yeah so our goal has basically been to make our resources and you know all the training material um, very uh, free, uh, accessible to anyone in the continent because we know how hard it is for software engineers to actually afford these engineering courses. We've been trying our best to partner with some of the, you know, engineering schools, you know, all this programming coding academy in Africa to see how we can actually tap into those engineers and see how we can get them in involved in this space. So uh, uh, I think if you go to melanin.academy, you see some of the resources already available. We're keeping on improving, you know, what we've done in the past because now we have an actual project, you know, that are working and we are trying to see how we can actually make sure, you know, some of the developers, you know, are able to now use that, you know, uh, platform to, to be able to actually achieve something. And so far, we, we've made good progress. Some of the developers or engineers, we... We, we, we are working with today at Bit of Africa, are people we've trained ourselves. And we always feel, you know, with this open source technology, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's an easy entry point for, for any skilled engineers out there, you know, because not everyone can afford paying, you know, all the expensive licenses, you know, you know to, to, to start coding. So we always feel like with open source technology, you know, blockchain is open source and, we, we try our best, you know, to leave these materials as open as possible to anyone so everyone can have access to it. So we, we are not charging any any fees right now for our trainings. Uh, I know at the beginning we had some corporate training, you know, executive training on blockchain that we used to charge. And our main goal has always been to see how do we work, for example, with the corporate to subsidize the cost or to give free training to, to the engineers. You know, we've had some few partnerships at the beginning where a corporate will pay, you know, some funding for us to, to train engineers. We did a, 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 an interesting uh, program with UN Habitat 
you know, uh, two years ago. And basically they just funded, you know, young engineers, young entrepreneurs in Nairobi for us to, you know, to provide them with this, you know, blockchain kind of, you know, bootcamp program and see how they can come up with ideas, you know, that solve some of the challenges that we have, we have in Kenya. So uh, we're trying to keep it as open as possible. We welcome any partnership, you know, anyone want to support the work we do in Africa, you know, feel free to reach out. You have my email, my, my business partner, uh, John Karanja email address, and we'll be able to, we'll be happy to, to discuss. We have an interesting comment. I would, I would like you to, to give your opinion on that. Let me read it out for you. It comes from Pascal Masocha. He says, cryptocurrency has been linked to the new world order that is associated with the mark of the beast and 666, purported to be coming with a COVID-19 vaccine. So there's quite a lot of conspiracy theories and strong beliefs you know that people have with regards to technology and the vaccine and all of that can you please comment on this yeah as i mean as you said there have been quite a lot of conspiracy theories you know so everyone uh entitled to their opinion so i mean uh so i think it's really hard to make a, a comment based on that uh we believe this technology will basically empower each one of us. So I think we welcome everyone to to learn more about it. And yeah, we, we look forward to, to, to the disruption. Right, so basically everyone who uh, wanna learn more about it can just go ahead, learn more education. I think it comes back to education. You spoke about it in the, in the beginning, like, mm -hmm you know, to just encourage people to educate themselves. It's so it's, I mean, like you said, everybody has their opinion, but um, at least to encourage people to read more, to learn more, and then make their own decisions, right? Totally. Yeah. Well, if there's nothing else, I would like to thank you, Christian, for this conversation today. It was really um, enlightening for me personally, and I hope that everybody who joined us today and everyone who's gonna watch it afterwards is gonna learn a lot from this uh, presentation. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is Hangout. Uh, it is a bi-weekly show from Leaders of Africa, which takes place every Tuesday at 2 p.m. UTC. Uh, we are live via Zoom and via YouTube. And we also have a Discord community where we continue these conversations. We invite you to join our Discord community. We invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we have more programs uh, lined up for this year. And we hope that you will join us again in the next uh, Hangout session. And so thank you very much for joining us today and uh, have a good day. Thank you.